Welcome back. Uh, we are going to dive in this lecture deeper into the tools for building reproducible forecast workflows. And um, as a reference point, I'm going to point everyone to uh, an FE task view on reproducible forecasting workflows um, that uh, kind of goes into more detail about a lot of the things I'm going to cover here. So I'm going to talk briefly in, in, in this order about uh, version control and integration testing, uh, literate programming, dependency management, and containerization, forecast automation, and, and I'm not going to talk about forecast archiving because we actually talked about forecast archiving uh, in the last <clears throat> uh, lecture on, on, on data management because we explicitly talked about FE's forecast uh, archive standards and the standard, again, just to re refresh, uh, the, the, that forecast archiving standard includes the file formats themselves in a preferred order, you know, NetCDF before CSV, um, includes archiving of the metadata that describes the forecasts, and it includes the idea that you should not, you don't want to just archive the forecast outputs, but also you need to archive the code and potentially even archive the containers, which comes back to this idea of containerization, which I'll get to more today. One of the uh, important things that I think is an important message to ecologists or just scientists in general when it comes to these sorts of uh, workflows is don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, software engineering is, uh, you know, probably, you know, half a trillion dollar industry. You know, there is big, big money here. There is a lot of experience and there's a lot of tools and it is well worth the time invested to learn a little bit <clears throat> about the tools and best practices that are actually used in software engineering rather than trying to make up things yourself. So don't, you know, I, I've been in meetings where, you know, ecologists discussed, you know, how they do, you know, manage their software and stuff like that. And it, it was horrifying. You know, people were using Dropbox or people were emailing files among each other. And, you know, it, it, it just, yeah, there's a professional way of doing this. And uh, what I want to do here is to give a quick introduction to some of those tools. So one of the things that I think is, is really important uh, is that idea of archiving our code and, and keeping track of the version of the code we're using. And version control software is, is kind of become an indispensable tool to anyone doing uh, code development. And it becomes particularly indispensable anytime you're doing collaborative code development like we are in, in the team projects in this course. So version control uh, is literally, it's tools to keep track of the versions of our code. And it is uh, I kind of think of it like uh, like Google Drive for code, because it it keeps one of the nice things about Google Drive and Dropbox and stuff like that is they keep track of past versions of things and in fact uh, are designed in some ways to en enable collaboration, uh, but they're really not tools designed for software. So so scientific or, or software version control tools kind of take that idea, but they're uh, provide a lot more bells and whistles and nuance that let you, that are really optimized for working with code. Uh, so it has this advantage of keeping track of history, allowing you to go back if you mess things up, uh, but also you know really uh, optimized for collaboration. Uh, this slide here kind of summarizes at a high level what I would view as the typical workflow of someone using version control. And it might, this might describe how I might, when, on days that I'm coding, how I might start my day. So I would start my day, when, start when, when I was very, you know, diving into a, a collaborative software project by updating my code. So I use, I, I pull in a copy of the latest code from the repository. So there's a collaborative repository where code is stored. I pull in everyone else's latest changes. So I know that I'm now working with the latest code. Uh, I may have to merge these changes into my conf my own copy if there are conflicts. So if, if there's things in my code that weren't pushed up uh, that are not compatible with what, what other people do, I need to resolve those differences. And, and version control software allows you to kind of dive in and, and manage those changes because sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes what you have is what needs to be in there and sometimes what other people have needs to be in there. And it's not, you know, unlike... Uh, Unlike Google Drive, it's not just whoever wrote, wrote it last. 
Um, so then you actually do your work, you edit your working copy, you add new features, you fix bugs, you know, you, you develop things. And once you've done that development, you commit these changes back <clears throat> to the repository. And particularly, you usually commit them to your local copy of the repository, and then you push those back to, you know, a centralized repository in the cloud. Uh, and then I'll introduce in GitHub, there's this notion of a pull request, which is uh, when you ask the, the owner of the repository uh, to accept your changes into the, the master version of the code. Another nice thing about version control is it, it supports this idea of branches, which is, you know, you might be able to make essentially, you know, copies of the code where you're working on different aspects of it and keep those uh, around simultaneously and easily pull them back together. So as a quick summary of uh, how a specific version of uh, version control that is particularly popular these days, GitHub, uh, how GitHub works, um, <clears throat> imagine the this distinction between, you know, GitHub on the top here, which is, you know, a cloud service that provides access to, you know, the actual soft, uh, the actual version control software is called Git. GitHub is the cloud service. And there are other uh, cloud services that provide uh, repos cloud repositories that work with Git. GitHub is just the most um, popular. So within the cloud, there's a distinction between you know, the, the owner of the repository and collaborators. So a project starts uh, when the owner of the repository starts a new project. There's literally a, a new button on GitHub. And, and for those working on the, the team projects, uh, you know, I've already done this step for everyone. I started the repositories off in the in the shared uh, group space uh, for the for the class. So when I start it, they'll on Git on GitHub, there'll be a project name or username, and then the, the name of the project. So you know, uh, for example, when you got the the hands activities for the class, you go to GitHub.com. Eco forecast is the name of the group. And then EF activities is the name of the repository for the ecological forecasting hands-on activities. If I want to pull down a copy directly uh, from the cloud, I will I do what's a, called a clone. Uh, on the command line, that's git clone. Uh, on RStudio, you can do this you know, kind of through a set of graphical menus uh, that causes that code to be pulled down. Now you have a copy of that repository on your local machine. You can then make changes to files in that copy in, in your local workspace. Uh, you then use git add to tell the repository that you're going to update something. And then use git commit to actually push those changes into the repository. The add allows you to have nuance about what you want committed to the repository. Uh, you, maybe you've made changes to one file, but you don't want to push it right now, but you want to push some other file. So it doesn't just do all, it allows you to have some nuance. Also note that if you're doing this through RStudio and the Git tab, uh, Git add corresponds to the checkbox. Uh, so you can add things there by just, you know, checking off files that you want to add. And then there's a commit button that does the commit on the GUI. Um, and then in both cases, you can provide a log message. So you, you try to this dash M, you know, start project is the idea of I'm, I'm providing a quick, short description of what it is that's in this uh, new chunk of code. So it could be like, this is debugging. Uh, I added this new feature. You know, it allows you to, so when you go back and look at the logs of the project, you can see what you did at different steps and it helps you identify if you need to jump back in the past to an earlier version, what they, what, which version you want to jump back to. Okay, so the git commit pushes that code into the repository. It's kind of in your local safe now, but that safe is on your local computer. So you want to push it to the cloud to make sure you have a copy of that and to make sure that that uh, copy is, you know, it's, it's safe and other people have access to it. Um, in our studio, the push corresponds to, in, in the git tab, literally an up arrow icon. Um, so now imagine you've been working on this project 
in your own GitHub repository, and now you, you have a collaborator that's decided to join your team and help you uh, on, on the development of that code. So the collaborator needs to start by making a copy of the code, but they don't make a copy locally. They begin by making a copy in the cloud. And that's done with this bu button called fork. And fork literally makes a copy uh, from the cloud, the space in the cloud, one person's space in the cloud to another person's space in the cloud. And that fork is a one-time activity. You only do that initially. And so when we set up uh, the labs, you know, some people were able to clone directly to the local version, but some folks had to create a fork uh, to be able to clone, uh, to be able to then clone down to their local machine. So now there's two copies of things in the cloud, the collaborators and the original. Now the collaborator can do some work. They can add to update the file. They can make a commit, push it into that safe, and then they can push that. But when they push, they push it to their copy, not to the master copy. For things to get back from their copy to the master copy, you need to do what's called a pull request. And a pull request is literally an asking uh, the owner to pull the changes in. The nice thing about GitHub is it will give you a graphical interface that shows you in color exactly what what lines were removed from a file, what lines were added to the file, it allows you to discuss uh, um, those changes. You can literally comment on any change on any line. You can suggest changes to line, and and sometimes you know this will you know before a pull request is is pulled in, you know. Uh, the owner may say, you know, no, I want you to go back and fix this. I want you to change this and do this the other way. And, you know, you can make those changes. You can push them up. Important thing to know about GitHub is anytime you push up changes into something that's already in an active pull request, that updates that pull request. You don't have to do a new pull request. That's a blessing and a curse. It means that uh, it's updating automatically. You don't have to do a pull request, but it also means that uh, if you update something and push it up that you didn't mean to be part of the pull request, it's, it is, uh, which is actually where the concept of branches uh, can be, come in handy. It's a little bit more advanced, but the basic idea is that on your repository, you can actually have essentially multiple versions uh, of the repository with different names. And you do a pull request from a specific name. Um, you can also merge things back uh, together. OK. So let's say the pull request was accepted. Now the, the original person, if they want to be working on the code again, they need to pull the code down. And note, uh, after this initial setup, the fork and clone are initial setup steps. But once you have things set up, you're going to use pull and push primarily. Because pull just says, I'm not making a new copy of everything. I just want to pull in the, the changes that have happened since I, I last uh, did things. So pull is, is lightweight. It only grabs the files that have changed. So I might make more changes. I add them. I commit them. And then I push them back up uh, to GitHub. Now, the collaborator, if they want to get those changes, they don't fork it again. Again, fork is a one-time step. They can now just do a pull directly from uh, the main repository. So this is now where things look like on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've, I've dropped the fork and the clone. Those are one-time setup steps. And we now see kind of the normal workflows. The normal workflow uh, for the owner is you, know, you pull down changes. You make you pull down the latest changes. You, you add new things, and you push those back up. And the, the workflow for the collaborator is you pull down the changes. You do work. You push them to your version, and then when you're ready, you submit a pull request to get those pulled in. <clears throat> One general recommendation when using any sort of version control as just a general recommendation for software development more broadly is to make incremental updates. So develop new features, commit the code for those new features, test the code, commit again if if you if the tests say that you did something wrong, push those up, do a pull request, and then move on to the next changes. So uh, 
uh, you should be when you're, you should be committing often. Uh, you should be doing tests, and you're going to you should be leveraging ideas that I'll talk about in the next slide of continuous automated tests and continuous integration. Uh, but the point is that that if ever so, remember if you have a commit, you can roll back to the commit. If if you uh, are putting lots of changes into a single commit, and it turns out that you did something wrong, you can't roll back part of it. You know, you'd have to lose code that is useful. You might lose code that is useful to go back to a version that last worked. Um, yeah, so commit often, uh, make changes incremental. And this is analogous to like when I talked about model building, you know, if you if you've only changed one thing and things stop working, you know what you did wrong. If, if you make multiple changes and something start stop working, you don't know which thing broke it. So one of the, the kind of added on features uh, of why version control can do things that, that uh, Dropbox and, and Google Drive can't is that is this idea of continuous integration. And so continuous integration is the idea that you know, when changes are made to software, you can set up servers uh, and cloud services that uh, automatically run things on that code to verify that it's working. So for example, uh, for the EF activities repository, I have, I'm use, using Travis CI, CI stands for continuous integration, which is a cloud service that runs a set of scripts that I've told it to run anytime I change the code on GitHub and specifically, I'm asking it to rerun all of our labs. So all the hands on, anytime I make a change to any of the activities I, and push them back up to the cloud, it actually reruns all the code to verify that it's still working. And so I get a message pretty immediately if I made a change to the code that broke something. So this is a good thing to set up anytime you're building a more complex problem project. And that can be simple things like verifying that code compiles, verifying that our packages build, verifying that certain analyses still run. And it's pretty flexible in terms of what you can ask it to do. Uh, since I started using Travis CI to do continuous integration, a new feature came up on GitHub called GitHub Actions, which is continuation, continuous integration that's built into GitHub. Uh, one of the actually nice things about GitHub Actions is it actually allows uh, some of the steps of continuous continuous integration to be run in parallel. So you might, if you have a complex analysis, you might say, you know, you know, uh, here's one set of tests I want to run. Uh, here's the second set of tests I want to run. And, and GitHub can run those two tests uh, simultaneously rather than having to do them sequentially, which can really speed up uh, things. Okay, so I'm going to kind of wrap this lecture up here and, and then kind of come back to the la the, the other tasks and in reproducible workflows in the next video. Thanks.